Okay, welcome everybody to the first webinar in our webinar series, Psychosocial Support in Emergencies. My name is Ia Susanna Kasha, and I will be moderating the webinar today. The webinars are presented in collaboration between IFRC Emergency Medical Services from the Health and Care Department in Geneva and the International Federation IFRC PS Center in Copenhagen. After today, and after the other webinars, they will be made available at the PS Center website. The aim of the series, let me just um, briefly introduce the aim, and that is to share experiences as well as to gather lessons learned in psychosocial support from emergency deployments. The webinar presents both the perspectives of the psychosocial emergency delegates and the perspectives of the host national society. And we also are very happy and lucky that we have a head of emergency operation giving her perspective in a later webinar. Um, those who can participate in the webinar, um, that's, they're open for everybody interested in mental health and psychosocial support, whether already involved in emergency operations or not. Each webinar will have a theme. And for today's webinar, we are focusing on two recent fact missions. We're focusing on the task and the impact in the early phase of an emergency. The presenters today will be Sara Seiber from Danish Red Cross and Amélie Doyon from Canadian Red Cross. When listening, now I'm speaking to you listeners, please mute your mic. You're welcome to type any question you may have to the moderators, and we will gather them this end, and we will group questions and post them to the presenters at the end of today's webinar. So um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, but before I do that, let me just introduce Sarah Saibia. Sarah has worked for many years as psychosocial program manager in MENA and Asia, both for Danish Red Cross and um, now she's and, and for, for IFRC, and now she's regional delegate for regional coordinator and psychosocial support for the Danish Red Cross. She's supporting programs in five different countries, and um, she's supporting five psychosocial support delegate. Sarah is based in Beirut, from where she will be talking. And she will talk about being um, part of a fact mission to Bangladesh in the recent big op, um, population movement operation. So over to you, Sarah. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, obviously, you can't reply because your microphones are on mute. But anyway, here we go. Um, thanks for the invitation to, to share my experiences uh, in Bangladesh. Um, I've tried to summarize uh, main lessons learned and recommendations, um, but very briefly I was deployed in mid-September uh, to Bangladesh as part of the FACT team, and um, I was there for three weeks. So I arrived I think on the 18th of September and I left again on the 9th of October. Um, one of um, the main uh, learnings, I think, from that is also um, related to my deployment. Um, as I arrived um, later than the rest of the FACT team, and I think it would have been uh, more fruitful if I had arrived at the same time as um, the other FACT members. Um, so here talking about wash, health, shelter, relief, uh, information management. Um, one of um, the highlights of, of this deployment um, was that we also had a protection, gender and inclusion fact member, and I worked uh, very closely with her. Um, but the reason why I'd like to highlight the need to be there together with the rest of the team is that in this way we could have ensured um, an integrated needs assessment. Um, so, for example, I could have teamed up um, with the health fact uh, member and uh, we could have had a joint assessment there. Um, and the other reason being that um, if we're there from the beginning, we can also ensure that we are mainstreaming uh, psychosocial approaches uh, into um, each sector and the emergency plan of action. And in this case, we actually did that. Um, and um, 
thanks to um, um, our team leader who was also very open to um, mainstreaming um, our approaches. Um, and so I, I think that's one of yeah the highlights um, of of my deployment was I came in with a sort of mindset where I was I thought I had to, I would have to fight uh, to convince the fact team that we needed to to mainstream our approaches and uh, in fact um, you know we, I was sort of preparing together with the P PGI fact member on how are we going to convince the team and and then you know when we presented what we wanted to do, I mean, the team leader and the rest of the team just said, yes, of course, go for it. So that was wonderful. Um, one of the reasons why we need to be there, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if I need to justify this to this particular group, but obviously you can't separate the physical and material aspects of, of human functioning from from uh, from the social and and, and uh, psychological uh, dimensions. And so I think the most effective way that you can address needs is to do so in an integrated way. Um, second point um, is uh, to recruit skilled interpreters from day one to support the teams on the ground. Um, this was really a challenge and uh, many of the activities um, that we planned were, were delayed uh, throughout my time there. Um, for example, training uh, of the psychosocial volunteers that were available. And um, we really struggled uh, with that because we, we couldn't really move forward, um, at least not with, with all of the activities. Um, and we needed people not just who could speak uh, Bengali, but actually the, the, the dialect spoken in Cox Bazaar in order to reach the, the Rakhine population. So that was a serious challenge um, and it really delayed uh, our activities uh, in terms of um, PSS and PGI. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think, I, I know that the IFRC has an agreement with uh, translators without borders, but in this case, we really needed people uh, locally um, to, be, to be with us from, from day one. Um, third point is related to uh, what we tried to do while I was there was, we tried to conduct a one-day orientation for all the teams involved in the operation. And uh, what we did was we focused on, when I say we, I'm referring to the PSS, PGI, and RFL fact team members. Um, we tried to um, give a sort of crash course on the Dignity Access Participation and Safety Framework, also known as the DAPS. Um, and also um, do scenarios, role plays, um, where they got to practice um, the action principles of psychological first aid. And how we did this was very much by looking at what was happening in the field and then trying to weave that into the DAPS framework. So a concrete example was looking at uh, distributions and seeing whether indeed we were uh, taking the, the DAPS framework into account there. Um, looking at mobile clinics, um, how people were standing in line waiting. Um, in some cases, um, you know, they were not given enough information about the clinic, the services, um, how long uh, the clinic would be open. Um, they were standing very, very close to the doctor and other patients, so there was very little um, privacy. Um, so just little steps that they could take to ensure that the area was more safe and to ensure that uh, people understood um, their rights and, and how they could access the services um, made a big difference. Um, and so we incorporated this into the trainings. Uh, literally by uh, demonstrating, okay, this is the distribution site that I saw yesterday, and this is how everyone was 
going about their business. And now with your DAPS lens and your PFA skills, how would you do this differently? Yes, thank you. Um, another thing I'd like to highlight is that we need to ensure that the staff and volunteers of the Operating National Society, in this case Bangladesh Red Crescent, um, are supported uh, as, they, as they respond to the emergency. Um, they were under a lot of pressure, obviously also from us, um, but just finding ways to give volunteers and staff a break. And in, in this case, actually, I would advocate more for the staff, um, really ensuring that they have proper breaks. Um, well, that didn't happen, and I, I really think, I mean, or it did, but it was quite late, uh, in my opinion. So I really think that's something we need to to plan for and th and and actually have, yeah, just make sure that we're actually doing that at the beginning of the emergency. Um, so, so helping the Operating National Society to, to have some sort of rotation or, yeah, a, a leave plan of some kind um, would be very helpful indeed. Um, and also to ensure that there are um, the, the possibility to refer uh, staff and volunteers who may need uh, psychosocial support or even more specialized services. Um, another recommendation, um, which is a general one for all operations, not just for this one, is that we adhere to the uh, competency framework for psychosocial support uh, delegates in emergencies. Um, I think it's very important, especially for the, um, the first, second rotations that we, we send people who are fully qualified and who can support the national society um, properly and also ensure that we're doing no harm. Um, so to ensure that we are more, more effective, um, I, th I, I would strongly recommend that we um, adhere to, to the competency framework. Um, last but not least, um, I think uh, we need to incorporate the uh, minimum standard commitments to gender and diversity uh, in emergency programming uh, and psychological first aid into the FACT, ERU, RDRT, and RDT trainings. And again, it's because I strongly advocate for us as a movement to work uh, in a more integrated manner. I think mm, we still have many staff and volunteers who think that integration is, is sort of an additional task uh, when in fact it's, it's just a way to work differently. Um, and that's how we should work to ensure that we are in fact enhancing the well-being of um, the affected population. And um, I think probably my time is up. So thank you, thank you, Sarah. Thanks a lot. And and what a wonderful way um, you ended it by saying integration is not an additional task; it's a way to work. And also mm -hmm. thanks for highlighting the different points that you did that there should be an integrated needs assessment with psychosocial support integrated, the need mm -hmm. for mainstreaming, and also the need that you mentioned that often we would not think about the need to have uh, good interpreters from day one who can help. And thanks for the description of the, the one day orientation with, with the scenarios. That was really interesting. Um, I think we may get back to some questions later on. Um, when the, I will just remind the audience that you can ask questions. Just type in your questions and then we will ask them at the end of the presentation. Maybe there will be questions on, on coordination or other things. So thank you, Sara. Let's pass, go on and let me introduce, um, Emily who will talk about a fact mission to Sierra Leone. And Emily Doyon is a violence prevention and community engagement and accountability advisor at the Canadian Red Cross. And at the Canadian Red Cross, she has both domestic and international responsibilities. Um, Emily has fact experience from Sierra Leone and has also worked as a violence prevention delegate in Haiti. 
Um, besides that, she's done a lot of other works nationally and internationally. So, Emily, um, would you take over, please? Yes. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Ea. Can everybody hear me well? I'm hoping to, yeah. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you are. Um, first of all, I want to start by thanking the, the Federation and the Reference Center for organizing this discussion, as I'm really grateful that we have this opportunity to get together and learn from past deployment. What Zara just shared, for example, is just so rich, and there's so much to learn from that. And people affected by crisis have the right to expect delivery of improved assistance as we organization learn from past experiences and reflection. And I don't know if you recognize this statement, but it's one of the core humanitarian standard on quality and accountability. And I feel that this initiative feel, uh, feeds directly into making us more accountable to communities by learning together. So this is just so critical in our work, I feel. So this being said, let's jump right in. Um, what you see on this picture is part of Mount Sugarloaf uh, that collapsed and the mudslide it created in the Regent Village area. This is a range of hills that is surrounding Freetown in Sierra Leone. And in the very early morning of August 14 last year, when most people were still in bed sleeping, um, the very heavy rain led to that massive mudslide and floods. The exact figures were difficult to establish, but the mudslides and the floods wiped out several communities, uh, destroyed more than 600 homes, about 600 people went missing, and more than 500 people died, and survivors took refuge into schools, some partially constructed buildings, mosques, churches, uh, temporary shelters. More than 1,600 families required urgent humanitarian needs, and right away, starting right then, August 15, the next day actually, a trained team of Sierra Leone Red Cross PSS staff and volunteers started working to assess the PSS needs and provide the psychological first aid PFA to the affected population. So on my side, I arrived in Freetown on August 22nd as a surge PSS deployment with the FAC team. And when looking at this picture, some people may ask themselves, so where did you stay? What, was it safe? Uh, but the reality was that the mudslide and the floods affected very specific area of Freetown and others were just running normally. So our team stayed in a hotel and had a place to eat uh, and, and we had a safe place to go uh, every night with an internet connection to, to keep working on reports and communications, et cetera. Can we go to the next slide, please? So you can just imagine that a disaster like this one would disrupt all routines and deeply affect the communities in the surrounding areas. Survivors had lots of fears uh, that the weather and the heavy rain would lead to more mudslide. People in the surrounding communities did not feel safe at all, but there was also search and rescue efforts going on, and people had hopes that they would find their relatives, even just buddies, so they wanted to stay around. So when I arrived uh, as a search PSS delegate, I had a few tasks and responsibilities ahead of me. The main one were doing the ongoing assessment and start planning uh, the specific PSS and protection response uh, following the assessment results. The second one was really supporting the capacity building of the Sierra Leone Red Cross and also support the advocacy and the liaison work uh, with the coordination structures in place and other actors in the field. So basically what it meant was working hand in hand with the Sierra Leone Red Cross to assess the different PSS and protection needs and also their capacity, the capacity of the population. Also assess the capabilities, the needs and the priorities of the Sierra Leone Red Cross in the area of protection and PSS and support the PSS focal point and the field personnel, the volunteers in the field, and support the development of the emergency action plan with budget, recommendations, et cetera, in, regard, in regards to uh, PSS, and support the emergency appeal operation. This was very important for the National Society to ensure recovery phase uh, for this response. There was other critical things to do, like map the referral pathways, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, uh, in addition to the advocacy piece, the coordination work, and establishing relationships with other agencies and movement partners, etc. So we can move to the other slide, please. 
So when looking at what was accomplished, I can think of some highlights and also some lessons learned and challenges. Of course, the rapid assessment, uh, needs assessment for PSS and protection uh, was done. So this meant doing the walk around in different sites. There was many different sites, um, along with uh, having informal discussions with community members, including children, including men, women, sometimes chiefs. Um, health and PSS, uh, Sierra Leone Red Cross staff and volunteers, and also other representatives from other organizations that were on site, including people from the Ministry of Social Welfare, Gender and Children. So this was all to get this general sense of the situation. But it was still difficult to fully understand the scope of the situation. Many people had been displaced by the floods. Some people had lost family members, uh, lost livelihoods. Some people literally had no roof, while others were staying with relatives in neighboring host communities and others were taking shelters into schools or abandoned buildings. So really the great diversity of that situation brought to light very, very different needs and capacities in terms of PSS and protection. And the PSS volunteers from the Sierra Leone Red Cross were working in teams. They were dispatched to the different sites uh, and they were there every day providing PFA referring survivors to health services, to food distributions, um, listening to what they wanted to share, what they worried about, and really try to find solutions to the problems with them. So they really did a fantastic job, and I have so much admiration for, for the work they did. And on my side, well, to support their field work, I work with the PSS manager, Nancy Bokari, on providing a refresher training on PFA, but also on additional information on sexual and gender-based violence and child protection in emergencies. We train PSS and RFL volunteers, Restoring Family Links volunteers, and we really try to uh, also provide some team building and sharing and, and a, bit of, a, a bit of rest uh, from the field, honestly, for the volunteers. Because they every day without day off for a very long time. Um, another thing was we also worked on the coordination, which was very frequent, time consuming and challenging as the situation was evolving all the time, like in every disaster situation, honestly, at the beginning. But there was also internal coordination within the movement, as well as external coordination with the government and field sector. So it was good to share this task with the PSS manager, as she could go to the field while I could attend some of these coordination meetings or vice versa, depending on the needs. Also, a critical step in terms of protection was completing the mapping of the resources available around PSS and protection. Uh, it had been started by UNICEF, uh, and it was shared with the Red Cross. So the document was a, a good starting point. The Red Cross services were added to the document, and we shared with the uh, we shared it back with the coordination groups, as well as with the PSS volunteer, the ICRC, the RFL colleagues, all the people who were in the field and were uh, encountering uh, beneficiaries uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So they were able they would be able to refer properly. We also developed a more precise uh, reporting tool. And we did a briefing with the team on it, but reporting remained a challenge. It was difficult. There was some confusion on the reporting form that was uh, used, and it was the form that the government uh, had shared first. It was interpreted differently by people. But honestly, I, I am not too sure that the, the, the new form that we created worked successfully. We tried to make it simple but precise, but it was difficult for the field volunteers to capture captured the different interventions that they as they were taking place so often i think it was an estimation and and that's okay too but i want to say that since that i saw the ifrc toolbox on monitoring and evaluation framework for pss intervention and i think it's a fantastic resource so have a look at it it's on the the website the library of the website so i'm just plugging it so all this to say that there was a great deal of accomplishment from the team, and I believe that the PSS response was making a difference for the affected communities, despite the challenges that we've encountered. 